This is the ultra low cost solar system that I built and installed more than a dozen years ago, and it has served us well for that entire time. The system generates power all day long and stores it in a bank of batteries. Once the battery bank is full, the inverters begin offsetting local grid use, and should the panels ever produce more than the local use demands, it's all grid tied as well so they can feed back to the utility, spinning the meter backwards as necessary. Thanks to the battery bank, the system can continue providing backup power for lighting, communications, security, and refrigeration silently overnight. I'll show you how I built the system so cheaply, how it's served us well for the last dozen years, where we found shortcomings, and what components I'm now replacing. Join me as I undertake upgrades of the panels, batteries, inverters, and more. Along the way, you'll watch me rip out the old system and then select, unpack, and install each of the new components, all right here in Dave's Garage. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And my garage has been hiding a little secret. You see, more than 12 years ago, back when Dave's garage was really just my garage, I built a complete lead-acid solar panel system with storage cells and inverters and charge controllers and the whole deal. It's even grid-tied and helps charge my wife's Tesla Plaid. And if you've seen my wife drive, you know that we go through a lot of electricity. Now, sure, power is relatively cheap here and we live less than 5 miles from the Snoqualmie Falls hydroelectric dam, but energy independence, even if not complete, has always been very appealing to me. When a windstorm can knock you out here for more than two weeks in the wintertime, being the only house with Christmas lights is always fun. Now that we've lived with this system for a dozen years or so, I'd like to do three things. First, I want to review how I built it on the cheap using largely industrial and surplus components. We'll also run through the essential benefits of lithium-ion over flooded lead-acid batteries. Then I'll select the major components for a new system before we tear this system out and begin to replace it with a much more modern lithium-ion-based system. It'll be a full 240 volt dual phase system and we'll do fun things with it like welding with it, lifting a car with it, running shop tools and charging the Tesla. The system I've got planned is like a power wall but with a number of other advantages so make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the follow up episodes. Today though is about the old system, why it needs upgrading and what I've learned along the way. That original solar charge battery system actually lives just off screen in a bank of cupboards only two feet out of camera range. Long story short, it's my super mega discount system with 18 amorphous solar panels, a big bank of 6 volt golf cart batteries, a 3500 watt harbor freight inverter, and so on. And although it's served us reasonably well for a dozen years, the batteries have probably hit the end of their lifespan and it's time to upgrade. I really want to go to lithium ion and that's how this video wound up being my first sponsored video. I get, without exaggeration, up to a dozen offers a day for me to do sponsored videos. From VPNs to standing desks to LED streetlights, I could be oozing sincerity for the highest bidder each and every week. But it's really not my style. Not to mention that for reasons my regular viewers already know, I'm not really wired to be good at that nonsense. And so I've never done one and assumed I never would. But this solar project was different because I went at it in a completely different fashion. First, I figured out the perfect product to buy for my application, and then I figured out who made it, and then I approached their marketing team and said, hey, this is what I'm doing, whether you folks are involved or not. But if you want to supply the product and then have a hand in how I select, configure, deploy, and use it, then you should sponsor this video. And they agreed. And that was it. I didn't promise to love it or even like it or say anything specific about it at all. I just wanted them to hold my hand a little bit through the install to make sure I was doing it right. The major components arrived from EcoFlow yesterday, so let's take a quick look at their unboxing. <laughs> no, this, oh, there's the, this side up. Yeah. Here, I'll get a nice little. Now, as you can see, one of these units was delivered entirely upside down, which would be a catastrophe for a lead acid battery, but probably not a big deal for lithium ion, though I'm entirely not sure. It says up, so I think we should respect that it says up in a particular direction and keep it that way. All right. And now, off the curb. Beautiful. <laughs> Good thing I got some hair out of the tires. This thing weighs well over 100 pounds, so now I'm starting to regret letting the air out of the tires. It's a little hard to push. I've dropped the first one off, so I'll run back with a hand truck, grab the second one, do my evil Knievel off the ledge. There we go. And look at the big EcoFlow logo right on the box. You can't buy that kind of product placement. Well, actually you can, but that's another story. I'll sneak this one in and put it next to the other one, which is up against my portable generator, which is up against my mess that everybody has in their shop. 
So back in the 90s when I worked at Microsoft, the number one on-the-job injury was actually cutting bagels and slicing into your hand. So cut away from yourself and be careful out there. Uh, specially formed packaging. So much better than the bag surrounded by popcorn and peanuts. And now, I know this makes me look incredibly strong, but remember, it's only charged to 30% from the factory, so I'm sure it's not near as heavy as it will be later. Now that I'm all warmed up, let me just uh, carry this other one in and set it down. No need for a hand truck, after all, it's not really all that heavy. In fact, now that I think about it, this is actually the empty box, and so, yeah, let me get the hand truck and get the actual battery pack. Can you tell I spent a lot of years in a paint warehouse? I spin that dolly out of there like nobody's business. Now, although these are very well packed, I kind of wish the box was knocked down in some way so I didn't have to lift it out of here. Now remember, do it entirely with your back in a fast, jerking, twisting motion. Keep your legs out of it entirely. Now, later I would figure out that these have a long extension T-handle that pokes out the bottom, but for now, I'll move around that way. This is the 240 volt kit that takes one phase from each machine. I'm still struggling to figure out where that is. In fact, I had to bust out the manual to figure out that it's not on the back at all, even though it looks like it probably could be. These are for the extra batteries, not for additional units. Here you can see the inputs for the extra batteries, for the solar panels, for the AC input, and a toggle switch. The 240 volt adapter plugs into each unit up on the front, and it must merge the phases and combine them to make a full 240 volt circuit. For some reason, this impresses me to no end, so I'm going to take my 240 volt tester and verify that yes, indeed, I really am getting 240 volts from batteries. And indeed, 220 is lit and 277 is flashing, so we'll call that 240 for now. With that out of the way, let's have a look at the DIY version that I'm retiring today. The system begins with that set of 18 solar panels. The issues surrounding panel types and selection are detailed enough that we'll cover them in a forthcoming segment, so make sure you are subscribed to the channel so you don't miss it. For now though, the two things that you need to know about these panels is that they're amorphous and very cheap. How cheap? Well, they were on the order of $25 a panel, and that was 12 years ago. You could buy them in sets of three, and they were being sold everywhere from Costco to Amazon, so I snagged six sets on clearance. I was determined to keep the cost down, since at the time, this was basically just a hobby project that I was experimenting with. They were essentially camping panels, but I wasn't going camping. That meant I would need my own mounting system for the roof as well. And since I was just learning to MIG weld at the same time, I decided to combine both and make up a set of steel mounts. To that end, I used some inverted U-channel and right angle iron. I then cut it into two inch strips and then drilled mounting holes that would enable me to mount each panel with two mounts on each for a total of four steel mounts with lag bolts run down into the roof. The amorphous panels are nice in that they're efficient enough to keep the batteries topped off even in the darker days of winter here, but that's about all the load they have to contend with. Each of these panels is only capable of about 20 watts on its own. And I suspect that rating is actually calculated for the panel if sitting on top of an Aztec pyramid at the equator during the summer solstice, because the most I've actually seen from the bank of 18 is closer to 300 watts. Well, on a mildly overcast day, you might see as low as 20 to 50 watts from the set, but the key for the system is that it's never or rarely less than that. That means that if during the day I can only store 300 watt hours of power, even that is likely sufficient to fulfill the primary purpose of the system running the security and telecom systems when all else fails. I have two levels of generator backup as well. A 70 kilowatt natural gas generator with three 200 amp transfer switches that is the core of it. It's not fully complete yet, but it already feels a little bit like flipping the breakers in Jurassic Park. A lot of fun. My house has 600 amps of service and code here requires that a permanent generator be big enough to run the whole house if you don't do automatic load shedding. It turns out that a 600 amp automatic transfer switch costs about as much as a used Toyota, and so I put it off for years until I realized that I could actually use three 200 amp panels at a fraction of the cost. Problem solved. But the problem is really only solved as long as you have fuel. A 70 kilowatt generator on gasoline would be no fun unless you lived on a farm and maybe had a large fuel tank or at least a pickup truck with a transfer tank. I have none of those things, so I went natural gas. That lasts forever, or at least until the next big earthquake. So as another layer of backup, I have a much smaller 13 kilowatt portable generator that can run on gasoline or diesel or propane and run at least two of the load centers as long as I'm being careful about what loads I actually turn on. I wouldn't be able to weld in a hot tub while cooking a turkey and drying my jeans, so you just have to adjust your consumption accordingly when running on these smaller power sources. The batteries then are really intended to serve when, for whatever reason, I can't even run a generator. And really, I can't run the portable generator unattended in the middle of the night. 
It's just too loud for one thing. And so that's when the batteries come into play. And they produce power only for some limited lighting, refrigeration, as I said, the various alarms, cameras, and the phone system. There's no point to being well armed if you can't see them coming after all. Now the batteries I selected for the original system were flooded lead acid as that was really the only affordable option back in that day. Each battery is 6 volts but the system is wired up as a 12 volt system which means that pairs of batteries are run in series to yield 12 volts and then those pairs are combined in parallel to produce additional capacity and amperage. A typical large 6 volt lead acid battery has a total rated capacity of around 200 amp hours meaning that it can supply 1 amp of power, at least in theory, for 200 hours. It does so at 6 volts, of course, and this produces a total of 1200 watt hours or 1.2 kilowatt hours. In sequential pairs, they become 12 volts and hence 2400 watt hours. The pairs of pairs come in at 4800 watt hours total. That means the entire capacity of the system is approximately 5 kilowatt hours. The reality, though, is that you'll never be able to extract all 5 kilowatt hours as the voltage drops the further you go. Even with deep cycle batteries by 50% capacity, most people consider lead acid batteries to be effectively dead, and so you can assume that you'll be able to extract at best 50 to maybe 75% of the rated power of such a battery. Lead acid batteries have a number of other drawbacks as well, not the least of which is the fact that they can only be discharged deeply a few times, if ever, without doing permanent damage to the battery by shortening its life and or reducing its capacity. And the more times a battery like that is run down, the worse the cumulative effect becomes. Deep cycle batteries do mitigate this effect to an extent, but not completely. The modern alternative to lead acid batteries is of course lithium ion. They are what power our phones, our laptops, our electric cars, and even some homes, at least if they're equipped with a Tesla Powerwall or a Ford Lightning or something like that. Let's take a look at lithium ion batteries and how they stack up against lead acid. For the sake of comparison, I'll assume batteries with a similar general capacity. For lithium, the charge and discharge rate is two to four times that of lead acid. If you're running simple LED lighting, this might not be a factor for you, but if you are trying to power anything that can spike a sudden load, from a table saw to a refrigerator to an air compressor, surge demand can be important. You might have enough total capacity in your lead acid stack, but providing the amperage you need at peak demand is easier with lithium. If you plan to charge your system from the grid during the day and then turn it off at night, however, charging speed can be a very important factor. After all, if you can't fill your battery in the charging window available to you, it doesn't matter how big the batteries are. Unlike the recommended deep discharge limit of 50% for lead acid, lithium can be run down to about 20% of its total capacity without harm. It is possible to so deeply discharge a lithium ion battery that it does damage, but the charge controller and battery management system between you and the battery will generally protect against this, shutting down individual cells before any of them get too depleted. In terms of charge cycles, lead acid batteries are usually all done after at most a few hundred charge and discharge cycles. In my case, this is not a super important metric as my system normally stays perpetually topped off unless the need for backup power arises. All batteries lose a bit of power over time. For lead acid batteries, this can be up to 10% of their charge per month, but it's much lower for lithium ion, closer to a mere 2%. The relative importance of charging efficiency depends really on how you're charging and discharging the panels. If you're using a scarce resource like solar energy, efficiently storing that charge instead of converting it to a bunch of wasted heat is pretty important. It may be less important to you if you're charging your batteries quickly from wall current, but it's still a factor to consider. Lithium ion batteries charge at about 90% efficiency, whereas 70% would be more typical for lead acid. In terms of charge density per pound, we should really only consider the usable amount of charge that we can actually extract from the battery packs after losses and inefficiencies. And if we do the calculation that way, it turns out that lithium ion averages around 35 pounds of battery per kilowatt hour. That's about half the weight of lead acid. Of course, if you've never moved them, it may not matter to you, but as you'll see, my new ones have wheels. In my case, the climate here is mild and the shop is heated, so it doesn't get anywhere near freezing inside. That's a good thing because both types of batteries are much less effective when cold. Temperature should be a factor to keep in mind if you're placing your batteries out in a storage shed, barn, or other location where they might be exposed to extremes. For the cold side of things, you can invest in heating elements or blankets that are automatically regulated to keep the batteries at an optimal temperature. I grew up in Saskatchewan, which faces minus 40 temperatures in the winter. In order to make starting the car easier, we often used electric battery blankets to pre-warm the large lead acid starting battery. The lifetime of a battery has three major influences how much it degrades over time, how much it degrades with each charge cycle, and how it handles abuse. 
The abuse can take the form of a too high or too low voltage, drawing too much current, or as just noted, temperature extremes. All of these can shorten the life of a battery regardless of its type, though as noted, lithium ion setups normally have intelligent management built in that can prevent some harmful scenarios like undervolting the cells. On average, as you've likely concluded by now, lithium ion outperforms lead acid by most measurements, but that doesn't mean that lead acid is completely obsolete. Properly used and cared for, they can provide a decade or more of reliable service, as mine have. The benefits of lithium ion combined with its drop in price over recent years have made it the way for me to go into my new system, however. And that's where the EcoFlow portable home battery system comes in. I looked primarily at three offerings, the Blue Eddy units, those from Jackery, and the EcoFlows. The Jackery unit can be had up to 2000 watt hours, but that's less than half of what I had before. And they don't seem to include the necessary hardware to connect the solar panels. They look like an excellent solution for camping, I'd say, but for home backup, they were a tad small for my application. Blue Eddy and EcoFlow both offer units that have all the killer features that I need. And those are large capacity. The Blue Eddy runs up to 5100 watt hours and the EcoFlow Pro units are 3600. Both allow you to combine multiple units and both are priced at around $1 per watt hour. Fast charging. The Blue Eddy can be charged at 3000 watts and the EcoFlow slightly faster at 3200 watts. Solar compatibility. I wanted to be able to charge directly from solar panels and I expect to upgrade my panels shortly to have much higher power units. The Blue Eddy supports 2400 watts and the EcoFlow can handle 3200. 240 volt support. I need 240 volts for some shop equipment and both support it if you have two base units and then an adapter. I'd already resolved to get a dual unit setup for just the additional capacity and with the correct harness that brings 240 volt service. Real USB-C power delivery ports. I wanted that and both of them have dual 100 watt ports on the front for running everything from MacBooks to USB-C soldering irons. At the end of the day, I'm confident either would have served me well, but since power and search capabilities were slightly more important to me than overall capacity, I wound up deciding on a pair of EcoFlow units, two Delta Pros and a 240 volt harness. And that's why I've partnered with EcoFlow to rebuild the system in lithium ion. And that naturally brings with it an affiliate link containing a discount code directly from EcoFlow. Check the video description for more information and for the product link. The next step is to rip out the old lead acid system, recycle it, and replace it with EcoFlows. I want to check the AC waveforms to see what they look like and then use them in a variety of interesting ways, from welding to lifting your car to running large shop tools. Just for fun, I'll be strapping them into the back of the Tesla as a reserve battery and seeing if I can charge on the go. We'll also try things like soldering from the USB-C ports and anything else that I can think of. And if you have suggestions that would be fun and entertaining to try with a battery pack, please suggest them in the comments. To see those, make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you don't miss the installation as well as the performance testing, where I'll try pretty much everything I can think of with it. If, along the way, you found today's episode to be any combination of entertaining or informative, I'd be honored if you would consider leaving a like and subscribing to my channel. If you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum. It's everything I know now that I wish I'd known back then. Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. Do, 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 do. do it, Glenn! Do it, do it! Do it!